to see you. Uh, my name's James, and I have a question for us to keep thinking about the passage we just read. Here's the question. If Jesus were to return tomorrow, what would you change today? Chat to a bunch of people who often say something like, I don't have to worry about that Jesus stuff now. now. Either it's not going to happen, he's not going to come back, or it's going to happen so far in the future, I'm going to have plenty of time to get my house in order before he does. You might be thinking that yourself. But what if you don't have the time? What if you were to come back tomorrow? What part of your life, if any, would you change today? Here's the warning from Jesus in our passage. Be prepared because you don't know when Jesus will return to judge. Be prepared because you don't know when Jesus will return to judge. Uh, if you got handed an outline on your way in, uh, feel free to have it out. I'm going to stick to it. It will help us work through our passage. We're going to look at point number one. They're tiny there, bigger on your outline. Number one, Jesus could return at any moment, so be ready. We see this in a few places, don't we? And in verse 42 as well. He says, therefore, keep watch, because you don't know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have left his house to be broken into. So you also must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now, talking about when Jesus is coming back can get pretty tricky and we can get bogged down in some of the details. But just think of the context of our passage Jesus is speaking to his disciples right in front of him, they're either tradies or fishermen. They know they're going to face a hard time following him in the future. And Jesus is making the big idea really clear to them. I'm going to lay out his thinking in these little points that appear up on the screen. This is all under point number one, and it's so we don't get sidetracked. Firstly, Jesus is saying, no one knows when Jesus will return. We see that in verse 36. This means you don't know when he's coming back and neither do I. And neither does Jesus, in fact, know when he's coming back. That's how I know other people don't know when he's coming back. Secondly, his return will be so sudden that some people will be caught off guard and caught out. His return will be so sudden that some people will be caught off guard and caught out. To paraphrase verse 37 onwards, life's going to be very ordinary. People are going to be planning weddings and birthday parties, thinking life's going on forever. They'll be waiting in line at Woolworths. They'll be heading to Bunnings for pot plants. They're going to be thinking that they still have time and still have tomorrow. And that's when Jesus will come back as quick and unexpected as a thief in the night. And here's the main point he wants his people to hear. We can tell it's his main point because he gives three parables or illustrations or stories so that we know what he wants us to do. The third point is live in a way that you're always ready for his return. Live in a way so you're always ready for Jesus' return. Uh, Jesus does tell us three parables that Jenny read out for us earlier. They help us to work out what it looks like for us to be ready. So that if you were to come back now or next year or in a thousand years, it would be an occasion for us to celebrate, to look forward to. Regardless of when he returns, Jesus calls us to be ready today and the rest of our lives. Uh, let's look at the first parable, which teaches us to be prepared by being wise and obedient. We're already at point two. Be prepared by being wise and obedient. Uh, the parable starts in verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has him put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? And this parable is easy enough to understand. The master leaves and he gives one servant responsibility to care for the others. If he's wise, he'll obey his master's instructions and he'll be rewarded. It's the loving thing to do, right? Looking after the family. It's also the smart thing to do. He knows that his master could return at any moment. And he's going to have to give account for what he's done. 
He doesn't hang out at the window or the door trying to look for the master and then get things in order. No. Instead, he just gets on with the job of loving, serving people, fulfilling his responsibility. He obeys his master's instruction. And that means it doesn't matter when the master comes back. And there are many faithful and wise servants like this person in our parable in our lives today. They could be our parents or our teachers. They could be our pastors. They could be our bosses. Or they could be our friends. And they're around and in our lives and they take their responsibility seriously of caring for others because they know how much God loves those under their care. And what a great reward it will be when Jesus returns to find his precious people well nurtured and cared for. Verse 46, it will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. That is good news. But each of these parables also has a warning down in verse 48. Suppose a servant is wicked and dumb. He neglects those he's responsible for. He thinks he's free to do whatever he wants, and he spends his time getting drunk with his mates. This servant forgets that the master has given him a task, and the master is coming back. And that master cares greatly for the people under his care. Well, when the master returns, hear the intensity of the language. He will be cut to pieces and assigned with the hypocrites where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The language is intense, and it's meant to be a wake-up call for the listeners listening then and for us listening today. The rewards and consequences will be great when the master returns. It's one or the other. And there are many wicked and foolish servants out there and in our lives as well. There's parents, there's teachers, there's pastors, there's bosses, and even friends who neglect their responsibility to care for others, who've ignored the task that God's given us all of loving him and loving others. And when the master returns, they'll have to answer for how they've treated others. So let's hear this warning. If Jesus were to return, what kind of servant are we being in his household? Are we getting on with the task of loving and serving others, obeying his instructions, or, like the wicked and lazy servant, are we ignoring others? We're getting on with loving and serving ourselves, having kind of our blinkers or our blinders on, so we just focus on the here and now and us. Are we caught up with other things so that people are going uncared for or not looked after? That's the first warning Jesus wants his followers to understand about when he comes back. Jesus warns his disciples to be prepared by being wise and obedient. He could return at any moment. But point three, also be prepared to wait. We see this parable in chapter 25, 1 to 13. He says, be prepared to wait for a long time because the wise are prepared for the long haul. Chapter 25, verse 1, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five of them were wise. The foolish ones took the lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, they took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. A common theme in each of these parables is that the master or the bridegroom, the authority figure, is taking longer than expected. We don't know when Jesus could return. It's been 2,000 years. It could be 2,000 more. What matters is, will you be prepared in the future? These wedding guests, they had one important job. They were to be there when the wedding party shows up to greet them and to light their way. That's their job. Some were wise. They didn't know how long the bridegroom would take. And so because they knew it was important to be ready, they packed extra oil just in case. The bridegroom arrives, the ready ones head into the wedding banquet, and they enjoy the party. And that's what Jesus' return will be like as well. It's described as a great wedding banquet between Jesus and his church, his people. Together in perfect relationship, 
with feasting and joy. Jesus doesn't want his followers to miss out. So he tells them to be prepared. And more directly, think about who Jesus is speaking to here. He's speaking to his followers who he know were going to suffer a lot in their lifetime. He says, be prepared, even if it means decades of ridicule while you wait, or of persecution, or of exile. Be prepared to wait and be in it for the long haul. My return is important. It will be glorious. You just need to keep going strong when I arrive. He's saying, make sure you don't miss out. And so what does that look like for us this many years later? Well, we might not face exile and executions like his followers did, but we're still waiting for his return. And we're doing that in a world that we're warned will hate us and reject us because it hates Jesus and rejects Jesus. That's not going to be an easy place to wait. The wise know it could be a long time and it's important to be found ready and waiting. For them, they packed extra oil. What is it for us? Well, the Bible says a lot about running the Christian race of persevering to the end, particularly in the letter of Hebrews. Uh, If you have a church Bible there or any Bible there, please turn to Hebrews chapter 12. It's on page 1,213. Uh, This is also written to a bunch of Jesus followers. They are suffering. They're having a hard time. And this is encouragement given to them. Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, and some page one, two, one, three in the church Bibles. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross scorning its shame and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of god consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart how can you still go strong as a christian in 10 20 50 years time as the world grows increasingly hostile well in hebrews we learn that we start by throwing off sin and distractions that tie us down and trip us up. It's a little bit like being obedient and focused in that first parable with a servant. And we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. We have to look for the bridegroom that is coming and prepare for his coming. We're here, we're warned that persevering as a Christian, it's not a default passive thing. It's an active thing. It's like swimming against the tide. If you give up swimming, you're going to go backwards or you're going to drown. You start drifting away. Jesus is warning us, are we being active in our Christian faith? What's that going to look like for us in the next season of our life, in the last season of our life? Well, for those who stay ready, they look forward to being welcomed into the great feast. Now, of course, each parable has a warning. This one does too. The other five, the foolish ones, they were caught out. When the bridegroom arrived, there wasn't any way to get ready in time. There's not enough oil to go around. There's no 24-hour Kmarts nearby. They went to join the party. They tried really hard at the last moment, but they were found lacking. They were refused. In fact, they were shut out from celebrating at all. Thankfully, it doesn't say there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth here, but the other parables will. What a great shame it would be to be invited to the wedding eternity with no more mourning crying or pain forever with our God to start that race out so well but then at the last hour be dragged down by sin to be distracted be caught unprepared what a tragic loss to see someone not finish the race and for Jesus to utter these words in verse 11 later the others also came Lord Lord they said open the door for us but he replied truly I tell you I don't know you. Jesus doesn't want that to happen. And if you're going strong as a follower of Jesus now, or you started out strong in the past, listen to verse 13. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. 
but we aren't just to wait and do nothing. Jesus warns us to be prepared by being faithful with what you've been given. And this is our last point, number four. Be prepared by being faithful with what you've been given. Uh, we see this in chapter 25, verse 14. It starts with another story. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey, caught his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work. He gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold, he gained two bags more. But the man who received one bag went off. He dug a hole in the ground and he hid his master's money. Jesus is warning us that what we do while we wait matters. The story, the master, in the story, the master gives his servants money, a lot of money, it's bags of gold. And their job is to do something with it, to steward it or to invest it so that when the master comes back, there will be more. They are to be busy and wise with the resources they've been given. Two of them do this really well. It says they put his money to work in verse 16. In fact, they double it. And after a long time, the master returns to see what his servants have been up to. And he's pleased. In verse 21, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The faithful servant looks forward to praise and reward and sharing his master's happiness when he returns. This is what many servants of Jesus look forward to when he returns. We see some of those servants as his followers in the Bible. I can't help but think of Paul, one of his uh, disciples, one of his followers. Uh, he struggled a lot in his life, didn't he? He was shipwrecked. He was rejected. He was in prison. He was beaten but he did all of that so he could use his skills and his time and what he's been given to tell hundreds, if not thousands, the gospel. In Philippians 1, 21 to 22, Paul tells us how, this lives, how he lives this out. This is from Philippians 1, 21. This is like his life motto. It's what he'd have on the back of his car. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And in verse 22, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? Both are fair options for him. I do not know. Paul's mission in life is to be faithful with what he's been given, which for him is the gospel. His identity, he describes himself as a servant of the gospel. And his life is all about living it and sharing it. And he can't wait to be greeted by his master with his eyes welling with tears and hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in your master's happiness. What a great way to spend your life, your youth, your retirement to labor for the Lord. What a meaningful and fruitful way to spend your life while you wait for your master's return. That is a life well lived. And here Jesus is telling us too, how should we get on with life while we wait for him to come back, knowing it might be many years? He tells us to be faithful and wise with the resources he's given us, which is also the gospel like Paul. In fact, he's giving us his Holy Spirit. He's given us gifts and resources, skills, time, we're to put all of them to work for the kingdom as good and faithful servants. Now, I want us to notice something that's common in each of these parables. Jesus isn't telling us to do something to earn our salvation. He's telling us to do something with our salvation. Notice in the first parable, the servant is given responsibility over others. It matters how he uses it. In the second, the wedding guests are given an invitation to the party. It matters if they're prepared when it's time. And in this parable, the last one, the servants are given bags of gold. It matters, with, it matters what they do with them. The Bible sees no issue with calling people who have been saved to action. 
and to live out their new life. Turn with me to one last passage which shows this perfectly. It's Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. Maybe some of us have memorized this. Uh, It's on page 1174 in our church Bibles. Page 1174. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. This is what it says, Ephesians 2. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Our salvation is a gift from God. Even our faith is, so we can't even boast about that. It's only through Jesus. And because we have been saved, we're called to live a different life. We're called to do the good works which God's already prepared for us to do. Or in our parables, to wait for Jesus' return by getting on with loving and serving people. Or in the second one, to remain faithful to the end. And in this one, by using what we've been given for our master's glory. And notice that in the last parable, the servants are given different amounts, realizing that some of us have different gifts and capacities and resources. Some of us have a very low capacity at the moment, or maybe even for the rest of our lives. Well, Jesus calls us to be faithful with what he's entrusted us with, even if that's very little. Jesus knows our limits. He loves us still. His yoke and burden is light. Jesus is a good master. He's not a taskmaster. Some of us have been given enormous capacities and gifts and resources and times. And he calls us to be faithful with those as well. Let's put them to work in a way where we long to hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. This last parable also has a warning too. There is a servant who wasn't capable of much, but even what they were given, they wasted, they squandered. Now, they didn't steal it for themselves. They didn't even lose it. They were just perhaps lazy or fearful. They wasted what the master entrusted to them. In fact, they buried it in the ground and then they forgot about it. The master comes back after a long time. In verse 25, his master replied, you wicked, lazy servants. So you knew that I harvest where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has been given more, they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they will have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God gives skills, resources, and time to all of us, Christian, non-Christian, faithful, unfaithful. And some of us work very hard investing in things that will not last when Jesus returns. Others don't work very hard at all. They just bury those things in the ground. This parable is not about quitting your job and becoming a missionary, although don't rule that off the table. But remember, it's getting on with serving and loving others wherever you are. This parable is also not about selling all of your things, giving to the poor, although it might be, nor is it about are burning yourself out by working nonstop as if Jesus is coming back this afternoon. Remember the second one, we are to be patient and wait, be in it for the long haul. Instead, here Jesus is inviting us to spend our lives, to put our gifts to work, to invest in something that will actually last, that will see his kingdom grow and not our own. On that final day, to be able to receive his praise for a life well lived and be invited to share in his happiness. This passage asks us us a lot from us. I started off with that big question, if Jesus were to return tomorrow, what would you change today? 
and what he warns his followers is be prepared because you don't know when Jesus will return to judge. I'm going to pray that we might be people who are prepared. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus' great love. Uh, we thank you for his death and his sacrifice, which can bring our salvation. Lord, we pray we would be like the wise and obedient servant, the one who eagerly awaits for his return. Lord, we pray that with everything you've given us in our lives, we might use them for your glory, for your kingdom. And we pray that we might be able to persevere till we hear those precious words on that final day. Well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.